Good day to everybody joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's webinar is on translational animal models pain. My name is Rebecca, and I will be your XTalks host for today. Today's webinar will run, will run for approximately 60 minutes, and following today's presentation, there will be a Q&A session. This webinar is designed to be interactive, so please feel free to submit questions and comments using the questions chat box. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode, and the presentation slides will advance automatically for you today. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I would like to thank Eurofin Pan Labs, who has helped develop the content for today's presentation. Eurofin Pan Labs is a global CRO specializing in discovery pharmacology testing services. They have been in continuous operation for over 40 years, serving the pharmaceutical and biotechnology community, setting the benchmarks for quality, convenience, and scientific expertise. Their mission is to provide pharmacological testing services that predict clinical effects. Eurofin Pan Labs' scientific portfolio consists of over 1,350 tests ranging from molecular assays to cell-based models through proof of concept in vivo activity determination. Eurofin Pan Labs considers themselves, an, considers themselves an extension of their clients' capabilities, providing unrivaled pharmacological expertise and knowledge, superior data reliability, and innovative solutions for drug discovery. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today, speakers for today's event. Uh, first up is Ms. Linda Headley. Linda is the Global CNS Director at Eurofin Pan Labs, specializing in pain, affective disorders, and neurodegenerative diseases. Linda has 30 years of experience in preclinical pharmacology and drug development. Her industry experience includes time spent as Principal Research Scientist and CNS Research Manager at Roche Palo Alto, Roche Palo Alto LLC, where she spent 18 years in, neuroscience research, in the re neuroscience research field. At Eurofin Pan Labs, Linda interfaces with business development and operations to conduct efficacy studies for pharma and biotech clients worldwide. She consults with clients to implement custom study designs to determine the efficacy of novel compounds in CNS in vivo models. Joining Linda today is Dr. Tamara King, who is an assistant professor at the University of New England. Dr. King's laboratory uses recently developed approaches that allow for mechanistic evaluation of effective and motivational aspects of pain and pain relief in the preclinical setting. In a collaboration with Dr. Frank Pereka at the University of Arizona, Dr. King developed a novel preclinical re developed a novel preclinical measure of ongoing or spontaneous pain. This measure has been successfully performed across a variety of preclinical pain assays. So without further ado, I would like to hand over the presentation to our speakers this morning. First up is Ms. Linda Headley. And Linda, you may begin when ready. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I need to advance my slide, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm going to briefly review our CNS portfolio of services and concentrate on our pain models. I will review some of the acute and chronic pain phenotypes in patients. And then I will share selected validation data from our lab. I will look at a couple of models in the RAD and show related clinical testing. And I'm very happy to have today with us Tamara King. Um, we have a collaboration with the, uh, with the University of New England and Dr. Ed Bilsky's group. And Tamara has graciously offered to share her expertise in modeling pain with us today. Pan Labs has over 240 validated animal models in several therapy areas. These areas are supported by our technical directors who are experts in the field. For CNS, we offer models of epilepsy, anxiety, and depression, and models of psychosis, some of them old school, some of them more um, 
uh, sophisticated. There will be another webinar in the future on the affective disorders and neurodegeneration, so I'm not going to dwell on this side. Um, we will cut to the chase in just a moment for the pain models. I will just note our Cooper's own model of multiple sclerosis in mice. Here we measure myelin and test the effects of compounds that might facilitate remyelination processes in the mouse. And here you can see some data showing um, corpus callosum in mouse before and after Cooper's own feed. I'm going to show you representative data in some of these areas in, later on in the talk, so I won't dwell on the list per se. But for translational pain, we pretty much have most of the tr major trans translational pain models. And aside from streptozosin-induced diabetic neuropathy, I will give you examples of this data. Um, for the nerve injury models, uh, again, I will talk in more detail about a couple of, the, of these. To note on this slide, however, I wanted to talk about pain liability testing. Um, we offer models of tolerance, models of withdrawal syndrome, both evoked with naltrexone and spontaneous withdrawal. And in relationship to opioid research, we offer GI motility and respiratory depression. And with our collaboration with the, with the University of New England, we're able to offer tertiary models, bringing your compounds more forward uh, into uh, higher tiered models of liability, such as condition place preference and um, self-administration. We have several behavioral endpoints. You can list, you can see them here for our our um, pain assays: uh, Randall Saletto, Hargraves, the Von Fry as well as um, some other uh, measured endpoints that Tamara will talk a little bit more about. We also have ancillary services, bio biomarker analysis. We can offer microdialysis assays, testing for monoamines and cerebral spinal fluid or tissues. We have electrophysiology capabilities to look at mechanism of action. We can record from sciatic nerve or dorsal root ganglia cells, for example, in neuropathic animals. And we have the capability to do immunohistochemistry and improvise histology services. The slide here just shows upregulation of GPAT staining in lumbar spinal cord in response to bone cancer pain, showing its lateral response. We do studies the right way. They're validated with reference standards. Animals are habituated. We have inclusion, exclusion criteria, moving animals forward into randomized cohorts. The testers are blind to treatment. We provide interim data as needed for rapid turnaround in Excel spreadsheets and have very um, easy, accessible final reports online. All of our designs are customized as needed with multiple endpoints, provided that it's ethical. We provide all routes of administration. We do repeated measures over a time course. And in addition, we can take blood in life blood or plasma samples, terminal samples, CSF samples. We can perfuse animals. We can take brain and spinal cord to look at exposure or for immunohistochemistry readouts. We can also homogenate tissues of inflamed paws, for example, and look at cytokines. Let's talk about the market. We certainly have an unmet medical need in the pain field. It's the number one condition presented by patients to physicians. We spend over $75 billion annually on pain management. Current therapies, such as opiates and incense, are definitely not adequate for long-term chronic pain. We need new drugs. We need opioid-like efficacy, but with better tolerability and safety and lack of abuse potential. Actually, very few analgesics have come to emerge to the market in the last several decades. We have pregabalin, we have Quitenza, a transdermal patch for post hepatic neuralgia. We have duloxetine that was developed for depression, now approved for fibromyalgia, for example. And Creot, a CAB 2.2 blocker, which is limited to interfecal administration, which actually had very good preclinical data that, that translated to the clinical results. Certainly categories of, of analgesics. Um, that are out there right now have their caveats with regards to um, liabilities, excuse me, um, side effects. Uh, um, probably the number one complaint for gabapentin in clinic is somnolence. 
Um, the uh, SNRIs produce dizziness, na dizziness, nausea, decreased appetite, and sweating. And of course, the caveat with the opiates are all intertwined with um, uh, classic side effects of constipation and addiction producing substance abuse. Let's talk a little bit more about abuse potential and liability. Certainly, um, um, these problems are on the rise. This data from Dawn on the government website actually is showing a five-year leap in non-medical use of analgesics. I mean, just oxycodone combinations alone increased over this time period by 256%. The U.S. consumes 80% of the world opiates and 99% of the world hydrocodone. It's estimated there are 5.3 million drug abusers in the United States for pain meds alone. What's happening in clinical trials? Well, unfortunately, half of the failures in Phase 2 and Phase 3 pain trials are from lack of efficacy. Clearly, there's a higher demand for more predictive preclinical assays. Several um, targets failed in clinic. Um, however, they had preclinical efficacy in rodent models. Why did this happen? Well, maximum tolerated doses were reached too early. There was lack of target engagement. Pain stratification in the, in the clinical trials is a problem. Um, pain phenotype are different among individuals, and there's a 50% genetic contribution. There are comorbidities with anxiety, depression in these patients, and there is a clearly a placebo effect. Aside from the fact that some of these patients are depressed and go to clinic and feel better, there's a placebo effect even without comorbidity with depression. People go to clinic, have chronic pain, and feel better, and the scales reflect that. There are new targets out there. We know there's over 300 genes targeted uh, that could be targeted from the mouse genome uh, and, not, and mouse knockouts. However, are these really targets? We know that um, actually the, the um, patients of fibromyalgia and OA, that's a polygenic type scenario. So I, I'm, uh, people doubt whether uh, a particular knockout mouse is really going to be a good model. Some investigators believe that the same targets are good targets, and, and I would have to agree in many cases, but we just need better molecules to hit those targets. Let's talk about acute and chronic pain. The clinical phenotypes of some of the pain disorders are listed here, not all of them, but some of them. No susceptive pain is caused by activity in neural pathways in response to potentially tissue damaging stimuli. Some of these are listed here. I would have to say that medically we, we kind of got this covered as far as acute pain and, um, and medications. This is where we have an unmet medical need. In neuropathic pain initiated by primary lesion or dysfunction and damage to the nervous system. Complex regional pain syndrome alone, type 1 and type 2, re reflex sympathetic dystrophy and causalgia is a huge problem for patients, very high pain rating scales for the rest of their life, very poor quality of life. We'll talk a little bit more about peripheral nerve injury, trigeminal neuralgia, post hepatic neuralgia caused from um, uh, following shingles outbreak. Um, I would have to say that arthritis, both OA and RA, and postoperative pain, which I'll talk both about these in more detail, certainly have a direct line to um, neuropathic pain and, and influences of central sensitization. So let's talk a little bit about postoperative pain. The Brennan model is an animal model of, um, of surgical of post-surgical pain where there's an incision of skin and muscle described in more detail here. It has good place validity in clinic. The clinical correlate is incision of skin and muscle. The model employs the consequence of wounding on primary afferent activity, producing changes in signal transduction, and therefore causing peripheral sensitization of nociceptors. A useful model to determine the efficacy of pharmacological treatment uh, it's only during the early post-surgical phase, however, and the model reflects that. At day one, day two, we can get reversal of uh, allogenic, uh, reduced allogenic threshold in the Brennan model with morphine. 
That said, some procedures like bunionectomy, for example, where the muscle is deep tissue or maybe stretched or severed, uh, damaging peripheral nerves causes an increased risk in central sensitization. And here, um, post-surgical chronic pain treatment in clinic becomes a little more tricky. Um, they're looking at preemptive analgesics, particularly in patients that may have a high propensity for pain, um, as well as additional post-surgical treatments to reduce the risk of developing chronic pain, such as giving patients gabapentin. I've chosen the CSA-induced inflammatory pain as my representative um, inflammatory pain rodent model. Um, it's a nice model in our lab. We offer several measured endpoints, Alexinia, Hargraves, uh, randall Saletto. In this particular um, thermal hyperalgesia model, clients like it. It has a nice therapeutic window of effect. Um, and um, it is relevant in that in both animal models and in, um, in the clinic, Inflammatory areas alter plasticity of peripheral, peripheral nose receptors. They become highly sensitized, and they also produce uh, sensitization in areas in the non-inflamed um, areas. Moving on to nerve injury, I'd like just to show this diagram quickly, showing that the target tissue of nerve injury um, produces neuronal hyperexcitability by atopic firing of action potentials in primary sensor afferents, segueing into cell bodies of dorsal root ganglia, terminating in laminal 2 of dorsal horn of the spinal cord. This phenomena produces central sensitization in this wind-up phenomena. Uh, membrane excitability, changes in microglia, astrocytes, and gene transcription occur here. This phenomenon is sustained by low threshold input from C fiber input that is maintained over long periods of time. The central sensitization produces decreased thresholds to noxious stimulus, as well as sensitivity to normally non-noxious uh, stimulus, uh, thus hyperalgesia and um, allodynia. Well, investigators for many years in the 90s figured out all kinds of ways to injure nerves in rodents. Um, um, I'll talk about a couple of these. The first one I'll, I'll talk about is Gary Bennett's model of uh, uh, chronic constriction injury, um, loose, loose ligatures around the sciatic nerve. Um, so let's talk about that one. Here, this model of neuropathic pain in the rodent uh, per produces neural damage mainly in myelinated axons, with probably less than about a third of dorsal root ganglia cells being damaged. However, there is mid-nerve axon interaction, interaction with swan cells, the glial cells that envelop myelin. The clinical correlate to this model would be nerve entrapment, such as in carpal tunnel syndrome. In our lab, we use several measured endpoints, mechanical allodynia reversed by gabapentin, and thermal hyperalgesia reversed by morphine is shown here. The Chung model is another mainstay model for neuro nerve injury. Um, neural damage is caused in the proximal nerve areas with probably a, nearly all DRG cells being damaged with proximity to the, to the nerve injury. The clinical correlate is proximal peripheral nerve damage, such as in prolapse discs in patients. The thing to note is spinal nerve ligation, SNL model, is also used interchangeably with the Chung model, and that's really not the case. The Chung model also includes the ligation of L6. It's difficult to get a hold of, but we do it. it L6 innervates a portion of the plantar surface of the foot, whereas L5 pretty much uh, innervates most of that. But we ligate both L5 and L6 in our model. Mechanical allodynic thresholds are reversed dose dependently by gabapentin, and morphine works in the Paul withdrawal threshold in the Hargraves model. Moving on to taxol induced sensory neuropathy. Here you have neural damage in distal axon loss. You also have DRG cell damage. This, this uh, toxin produces systemic injury in the peripheral nervous system. The clinical correlate has 
pretty good face validity. Patients develop polyneuropathy that are on Taxol for cancer therapy. In the model, we inject Taxol to make per tick per day on days one, three, and five. You get a sustained long-term neuropathy in these animals. And again, we have multiple endpoints. We can do them in the same animal. We look at um, uh, allodynic threshold, reverse dose dependently by gabapentin, and um, as well as thermal hyperalgesia. Let's move on to bone cancer pain. Um, <clears throat> in this model, three microliters of uh, rat mammary cells, MMRT-1, are injected into the cavity of the female rat tibia. Here there's bone destruction. Animals over time develop fractures. And GTAP staining, as I showed in the previous histology slide, can show ipsilateral spinal cord involvement of astrocytes. The clinical correlate of this model has good face validity. Here, bone cancer pain patients develop also destruction of cortical and tubicular bone. And many, as they move on with this disease, um, have fractures in, in up to 50% of the patients. Here you can see a normal uh, CT radiograph of, of a sham animal. Medium is injected into tibia as well, as shown by the orange bar. And clearly by day 14, following tumor injections, you have a clear separation and an allodynic threshold that's been reduced. This can be reversed by morphine approximately day 18 to 20 days, 22 days um, after the MMRT cell injection. Um, this is a customized experimental design. We can dose preemptively at the time we inject the cells or before. We can establish allodynic thresholds and dose morphine out in this period. And again, out past this period, and here you get fracture in these animals. A disease modifying approach would be to give bisphosphonates. Zoledronic acid, however, does not consistently reverse pain. You need morphine like you do in the clinic uh, in this model as a reference standard. Let's talk a little bit about cold thermal sensitivity. I worked with Gary Bennett years ago to find a model where we could take his rats, the CCI rats, and, and get a good readout in cold allodynia. A lot of people put them on a cold plate, but you get cupping of the hind limb, and therefore the animal plantar surface is not making contact with the cold plate. Here they're free roaming in ice water bath, and they lift their paw. They lift the affected paw, as shown here in this pre-dose data. This is reversed by morphine. It's also active with sodium channel blockers like mixolatine and lamotrigine. Clinically, we have the human pressure test. Where Patients will put their foot, more typically their hand, in the cold ice water bath. Um, this test sometimes screens people's thresholds for cold allodynia in clinic. And women have a much higher cold pain tolerance than men, so it's generally gender specific. If you like YouTube, you can go there and you can see college students sitting in a dorm room with nothing better to do than see if who can keep their hand in ice water longer. And I looked at that, and men, one a gentleman had his hand in there for 18 seconds, and the girl went on to have her hand in there close to three minutes. Wasser and Brock reported gender differences in pain sensitivity in the clinic in his article. And here on the left side are human um, cold pain thresholds, both men and women. The men are down here with lower threshold than women. And when you compare day 0 versus day 1 to 0 versus 21, it's more scattered. And these are the men. So they do not seem to be consistent with their pain threshold with regards to cold, whereas women are, seem to have a better correlation. Interestingly, the heat pain threshold in this study is the same for each gender. It's more consistent from day 0 to 1 versus day 0 to 21. In osteoarthritis pain, um, human OA is a big problem, complete, uh, particularly in the elderly. It's a degenerative joint disease with destruction of cartilage and alteration in bone. There's definitely a central component to this model and a widespread decrease in pain threshold is observed in these patients. 
They have punctate hyperalgesia in areas of referred pain. And the pain scale does not really correlate with the radiological findings, suggesting, uh, again, a simple component to this model, to this uh, condition. In the rat, we uh, inject MIA at one milligram per kilogram into the interarticular space. And here we develop an allogenic threshold in these animals 21 to 20 days, 28 days out with a dose-dependent um, reversal with oral gabapentin. Uh, morphine also works in this model. Um, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit more about M this MIA model. Tony Dixon, Dickinson published on uh, a, a higher dose of 2 mg per kg, but I'll, um, I'll leave that. Um, to Tamara to tell us a little bit more about. <clears throat> I have the opportunity to meet and discuss and see the data twice at the SMI pain conference meeting in London with Dr. Lars Andret Nielsen. He is director of the world's largest translational pain center in Aalborg University, Denmark. He's done some brilliant work mapping the pressure pain sensitivity and thresholds in both normal patients and LA patients. And here you can see a color scale showing the pain threshold. Um, these these uh, measurements are uh, employed quite a bit in his, in his clinical group. And he has a CRO that actually does these clinical tests. And there are other measures from other groups where they can me measure out distally as well, even looking at um, the field or mechanical allodynia. Well, in summary, clinical pain is polymodal. We have personalized medicine becoming more and more important as we try to find new molecules for pain. And pharma is realizing that a realistic strategy to address both scientific, regulatory, and commercial risks of drug development is really the way to go. Biomarker strategies are coming into play. Patients are being phenotyped before they go into clinical trials and for uh, appropriate uh, meds um, in, in clinic diagnostics. Certainly, uh, functional MRI imaging is, uh, is, is becoming more important, even in the rodent setting, but more, uh, more coming um, to play in the clinic. This is a, a functional MRI of punctate um, acute uh, pain insult versus more of a chronic pain insult. And um, also using human tissues is bridging the gap um, to the clinic. Primary neurons are being uh, looked at, as well as stem cell-derived cell lines. So for pharma, the outcome measures may reduce reward monetarily, but it will also reduce the risk, and it also may bring new medicines to market. What about animal models of pain? Well, we need them. We need to test efficacy of novel compounds. We need to look at side effect profiling. We need to develop that therapeutic index early on in the animal model. We need early de-risking in models. We need liability testing for tolerance and abuse potential. We need to employ more biomarkers in the animal model. And more importantly, we really need more relevant predictive animal models for chronic pain. And with that, I'm going to segue into Tamara King's uh, presentation that we're looking forward to today. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. I will be giving a brief overview of recent and ongoing efforts to develop animal models of pain with improved translational value to clinical pain states. Now, as has been outlined, there can, are multiple pain syndromes, which can be roughly categorized as illustrated by this nice slide adapted from Clifford Wolf. Nociceptive pain is pain in response to noxious stimuli, and it serves a protective function and is associated with healing and repair. Now, there are a number of pathological pain states as well that can be categorized according to inflammation playing a role, such as in arthritis pain, a role of neuronal damage, such as in neuropathic pain, and there are dysfunctional pain states in which there is no overt or obvious noxious stimulus, no inflammation, and no neuronal damage. 
Now the biology underlying these pain states is likely to be different, indicating that specific mechanistic treatments for different pain states are indeed necessary. In order to develop new and improved therapies for pathological pain states, a better understanding of pain mechanism is required. Now in order to do this, we turn to animal models. And so I would like to give a brief overview of what an animal model is, which was nicely captured by Jeff Mogul in this article in Nature Reviews Neuroscience. Animal models are comprised of a number of components, including subjects, assays, and measures. Within each of these components, there are a number of factors that must be considered. For example, when one looks at subjects, not only do we have to consider species and strain when choosing our subjects, but we also have to bring into consideration the animal husbandry, as well as testing procedures, both of which have been shown to modify or change animal pain behaviors. Now the dominant paradigm in basic science and analgesic drug development is assessing behavioral outcomes in laboratory animals, primarily rats, and with the development of transgenic models, mice. Now transgenic mice can allow for study of the role of individual proteins or molecules in pain in the absence of selective ligands or antibodies. This can allow for proof of concept for further analysis and perhaps drug development targeting these molecules. Now subjects are generally chosen to reliably produce the pain state of interest such as nerve injury induced pain. However, it's important to also note that important insights into mechanism may be learned by analysis across strains showing differential pain outcomes. For example, this has been done across different strains of mice, particularly by Jeff Mogul's group, and it can also be done across different strains or substrains of rats showing different outcomes to nerve injury, for example. Another aspect of this is that we can choose strains that show variable outcomes, which may provide information regarding mechanisms driving pain, chronification of pain, or pain relief. For example, our group demonstrated that engagement of descending inhibition protects against chronic neuropathic pain in Holtzman rats. Now the next aspect of an animal model that I'll briefly overview are the assays. And there are various assays that have been developed across time, with the first assays being nociceptive assays. And these animal responses to noxious stimulation applied to a convenient body part, such as the tail or the hind paw, are assessed. Now these might relate to human responses to an acute noxious stimulus such as perhaps touching the stove or a burning hot stove. However, they do not reflect more complicated pathological pain states in order to get a better understanding of what happens in these pathological pain states. Other assays have been developed, such as inflammation assays, wherein various irritants are injected into, for example, the hind paw of the animal. In addition, so that I had already indicated, various neuropathic assays have been developed wherein there is surgical transection, ligation, or both made to a nerve, very commonly the sciatic nerve. This tends to reliably produce hypersensitivity across a range of modalities such as tactile or thermal stimuli. Now, these assays are appropriate to investigate mechanisms but they are really not intended to replicate the full disease. Therefore, there have been ongoing efforts to develop painful disease assays, including things like cancer-induced bone pain, diabetic neuropathy, or headache pain. And as you can see, I have a long list here of painful disease assays that have been developed, and I'll note that this is not a complete list, and that there are still ongoing efforts to provide even more painful disease assays. Now the final aspect of the animal model that I will be focusing on are the measures. And this is what I will be focusing on for the remainder of the talk. 
Now, the most widely used measures in animal pain research tend to be reflexive withdrawal to either noxious or non-noxious stimuli. In addition, many look at spinal vocal spinal reflexes, such as licking, flinching, or biting a painful area. Now, these are simple behaviors that can be easily scored, and they allow for relatively rapid analysis of time course, as well as dose response for test compounds. However, these acute studies are often performed in uninjured animals, and therefore the relation to clinical pain symptoms is uncertain. Moreover, most of these pain behaviors can be performed in decerebrate animals, and we know that pain involves supraspinal processing, and so these behaviors feel somewhat incomplete. Therefore, many have turned to other behaviors such as behavioral measures of use or function of an injured hind limb. These include measures such as weight bearing, guarding behaviors, limb use rated in an animal walking across a flat surface, and attempts to automate such um, outcomes have been developed as well, for example, the catwalk assay. Now it's important to note that these behaviors may or may not reflect ongoing or spontaneous pain. Indeed, they may reflect enhanced pain due to ambulation or enhanced pain due to contact of hypersensitive area with the ground. They also may reflect learned avoidance of activities that may evoke pain in the injured area or that aggravates the pain that they are experiencing, reflecting learned behaviors or learned activities. Now, if you have an injured or sprained ankle, for example, you may not want to put your weight on that ankle because it may aggravate pain if the ankle is actually in pain. But if the ankle is not in pain at the time, it may elicit pain in that injured area. Now, regardless of the underlying reason for the change, these behaviors reflect alterations in the use and function of the injured region, as is observed in patients. Now, there has been recent interest in developing measures looking at alteration in involuntary as well as voluntary measures, and I will briefly describe some of those. Dr. Mogul's group has developed a measure in which they code the facial expressions of pain in the laboratory mouse. In characterizing this, they note that not just stimuli of moderate duration, for example, 10 minutes to 4 hours, are most likely to be associated with a pain face. More transient noxious stimulation or chronic st uh, pain states lasting days do not seem to be as associated with the pain face. Others are focusing on behavioral outcome measures that are ethologically relevant to a social and prey species. For example, Dr. Rice's group is looking at spontaneous burrowing behavior in the rat and they have certainly noted that this is a found in the natural setting. What they've demonstrated is that nerve injuries such as tibial nerve transection reduces spontaneous burrowing in rats, and that this can be reversed with administration of gabapentin, giving some pharmacological validation to this measure. In addition, they are looking at a measure of thigmotaxis, in which the animal prefers a walled area compared to the open exposed middle area of an open field. Now, in a normal or uninjured animal, you'll see that over time the animal will indeed go to the center of the arena and explore. However, this group has demonstrated that in the setting of nerve injuries, such as spinal nerve transection, the rats show reduced exploration of the center area of the open field. Again, they demonstrate that this is reversed, uh, reversed by administration of gabapentin. However, it should be noted that anxiolytics, such as diazepam, can also increase exploration of the center of the open field. And this brings into question whether this measure is specific to pain or also relates to other pain states, such as anxiety. Now, in a recent article, Dr. Wolf's group did a nice characterization of we, uh, voluntary wheel running in mice. They demonstrated that bilateral injection of CFA re reduced wheel running in the mice. 
whereas unilateral injections fail to do this. And this likely reflects the ability of these quadruped animals to adapt to unilateral injury and run in three legs rather than four. Now this group went on to characterize this using pharmacological measures. And they used a variety of drugs known to alleviate inflammation pain in humans. What they found was a nice correspondence in the level of potency across these different drugs that corresponded to what we observed in the clinic. They then took the uh, effective dose of each of the compounds and looked to see whether they reversed CFA-induced tactile hypersensitivity. And they found that in all of these compounds, the chosen dose was ineffective in alleviating the CFA-induced tactile hypersensitivity. And so in conclusion, they nicely demonstrated that potency of observed drugs effects are consistent with that observed in patients. And they note that higher sensitivity of voluntary wheel running to drug effects may more accurately predict efficacious drug doses in humans than reflexive withdrawal. Now, another category of measures being developed and validated are based on motivational aspects of pain. And one such measure being developed is the place escape avoidance paradigm, or the PEEP assay. This has been developed by Dr. Fuchs' lab. And what happens here is a rat is placed in a light, dark box. And it is pretty well established that rats prefer to spend most of the time in the dark box. Now what they did is in animals with an injury to one of the hind paws or hind limbs, they probed that hind limb with a ball trifilament. This causes a conflict in the animal. Do they want to stay in the dark chamber where there actually is pain associated with it? Or do they move into the less preferred brightly lit chamber? And what they see is that animals with injury do indeed move to the brightly lit chamber where the contralateral uninjured hind paw is probed. This is not observed in uninjured or control animals who remain in the dark box. Now, Dr. Fuchs and colleagues showed that these are measures of affective or motivational aspects of pain by selectively lesion brain areas that have been implicated in these aspects of pain, both in animals as well as in humans. In addition, they did have done pharmacological char characterizations of this measure. For example, they demonstrate that low-dose aspirin attenuates escape avoidance behavior, but does not reduce mechanical hypersensitivity as measured by reflexive response, similar to what I just described in the voluntary wheel running. Now, this assay is a nice measure of tactile hypersensitivity, which can relate to, to patients with tactile hypersensitivity or hypersensitivities within the clinic. However, many patients come to the clinic describing and suffering from non-evoked background pain or pain that is just there. This is referred to as spontaneous or ongoing pain. And this has been reliably very difficult to measure and there have not really been many measures that have been validated for this. And so one measure that has been able to assess this is looking at self-administration. So it's pretty well established that rats will pr uh, level press for food or other rewarding um, stimuli, including drugs of abuse. Dr. Martin and his colleagues demonstrated that Rats will also lever plus for pain relief. They took nerve injured animals by spinal nerve ligation or normal animals, and they demonstrated that animals with the nerve ligation would maintain self-administration for spinally administered quantity. The uninjured animals did not maintain the self-administration for the spinal quantity. Now this is nicely consistent with human observations that spinal clonidine diminishes ongoing or spontaneous pain in patients. Now I'll note that there are multiple lab 
laboratories that are using various self-administration paradigms to examine various questions, including things like abuse potential in drugs that have pain alleviating properties, how pain may alter reinforcing properties of drugs of abuse, including opioids, and how pain may alter function of limbic reward pathways. I'd like to conclude by describing a measure that we have developed to unmask chronic spontaneous or ongoing pain. Now this measure was developed based on the idea that tonic aversive stimuli provide motivation that drives behavior, and clinical observations that taking pain away feels good. Certainly, relief of pain can be conceptualized as a reward. And this um, captures the concept of negative reinforcement, wherein an increase in future frequency or likelihood of behavior is observed due to the removal of an aversive stimulus. And so we propose that negative reinforcement can be used in animals to unmask pain that is just there. In fact, we feel that pain relief is a prime example of negative reinforcement, associating a specific event such as taking a medication with removal of an ongoing stimulus such as pain will increase the behavior of, of taking the medication. Now we looked at this in the preclinical setting using a well-established and characterized uh, measure from the addiction literature, condition place preference. Here you see a three-chamber box where chambers are distinguished by visual, tactile, and odor cues. What happens is the animals are placed in these boxes and allowed to explore all three chambers across a period of 15 minutes. And this is done to habituate the animal to the chamber as well as to verify that there are no pre-existing biases from one chamber over the other. The following day, the animal in the morning is giving a neutral treatment such as vehicle and confined to one of the chambers for 30 minutes. Four hours later, the animal is given a pain alleviating manipulation and confined to the opposite chamber for 30 minutes, allowing association between the pain relief and the context. And what we have demonstrated is that pairing a context with a treatment that produces pain relief results in an increased time spent in that context. Now we've gone on to further characterize this measure and have demonstrated the condition place preference will be observed only if the aversive state induced by chronic pain is present. The condition place preference will be observed only if the treatment relieves the aversive state. It is observed in animals with complete denervation of the hind paw, so it's not due to ambulation in the testing chamber. Moreover, we've demonstrated that it is established with drugs that are effective in alleviating spontaneous or ongoing pain clinically, such as spinal administration of clonidine or omega chromatoxin, or systemic administration of gabapentin or duloxetine. In contrast, it is not induced by drugs that are not effective in spontaneous ongoing pain clinically, such as spinal administration of adenosine. Now, we have observed this uh, condition place preference to pain relief across multiple assays, including neuropathic, osteoarthritis, cancer, and post-operative pain. And we have used this, assay, this measure for mechanistic analysis of spontaneous pain. And one thing that I would like to emphasize is that it is not the pain assay, but pain-induced aversiveness that elicits motivation to seek relief. And so, to summarize, I have tried to give a broad overview of efforts to improve animal pain models to enhance translation to the clinical setting. But a number of considerations must be taken into account when thinking about this. First, animal models are comprised of subjects, assays, and measures, each of which must be considered in relation to the clinical syndrome of interest. New animal models should undergo validation for specificity to pain. There should be pharmacological validation, demonstrating comparison of clinically effective drugs to clinical observations. So there should be corresponding efficacy across drug families. There should be corresponding efficacy across syndromes. And there should be corresponding efficacy between symptoms. There should also be a correspondence between the dose ranges observed in the preclinical measure and clinical doses. And this has been demonstrated 
and that higher doses are required for reflective withdrawal compared to voluntary or operant behavioral outcomes. Finally, I'd like to point out that preclinical measures should relate to the targeted clinical symptom. So tactile or cold hypersensitivity are appropriate to compare to tactile or cold allodynia within the clinic. However, ongoing and spontaneous pain measures are needed to compare to verbal reports of pain that is just there. And with that, I would like to thank my laboratory at the University of New England. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Samara. I've also uh, just invited Linda, Ms. Linda Headley back on the line uh, because now is the perfect time to start off our Q&A session. So just as I've uh, mentioned uh, through chat, I invite all our attendees to continue sending their questions in to our speakers, um, and we're happy to have this informal and interactive discussion about some of the issues that have been addressed today. I'd also like to thank our speakers, Ms. Linda Headley and Dr. Tamara King, for their informative presentation. So I've already received a number of great questions, and I think it would be wonderful if we started off with those. So our first question to kick off our Q&A event is for Linda. Someone has, someone has written in, how long after paclitaxel administration can you typically accept, expect to see the development of allodynia? Well, that's a good question. You certainly get a, a sustained effect with paclitaxel-induced uh, allodynia. We usually test at days 21. Um, there's a good reference paper if the client, uh, if the uh, person would uh, ad be identified at some point. Um, Gary Bennett has published on the, the uh, long-term effects of paclitaxel. Again, um, we can use the model to test out for a longer time course, but um, these are client paid studies and they're looking for efficacy as well as perhaps duration of action. But I would say in general, day 21 would be a good day. Great. Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, I, I should also mention, Tamara, you're more than welcome to, Dr. King, you're more than welcome to jump in if you feel like you want to add anything um, to what Linda has said and vice versa. So I have another question for Linda. Um, it comes from another attendee who writes in, we screen a lot of compounds in CCI animal pain models. There are generally three behavioral tests we run, tactile, inca incapacitance, and thermal. If two of, of the behavioral tests show positive dose response and the other does not, how do we, do we interpret the data? Is one a good compound and another a bad compound? Um, Linda, can you talk a little bit more about this? So they're running tactile allodynia, thermal hyperalgesia, and weight-bearing in the CCI animal? Um, it looks like, so they mentioned three behavioral tests, tactile, incapacitance, and thermal? Yes, yes, that's what I understood. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, two out of three isn't bad, but clearly we're talking about uh, different conditioning stimuluses here. and. And weight-bearing, I would have to say, is probably not my favorite assay for, um, for the CCI model. And maybe Tamara might want to comment on this. Those animals have to be uh, habituated, and they, they really are fairly comfortable in the incapacitance meter. So I would not hold a lot of weight, no pun intended, on that one. Having said that, um, if they're looking at tactile analdenia and thermal hyperalgesia, um, I found that the CCI model was better for cold allodynia and thermal, uh, cold allodynia and tactile uh, allodynia rather than thermal hyperalgesia. But, um, but again, um, we're talking about different conditioning stimuluses here mm -hmm. with perhaps uh, tactile allodynia being um, more involved with A-beta fibers and hyperalgesia particularly with Pembroke, more involved with um, a delta fibers. Tamara, did you want to comment on that as well? Um, you have probably more experience with incapacitance readings than I do. Um, yeah, I mean, typically we can, uh, use the incapacitance readouts more for our models of osteoarthritis. Uh, I agree with you that probably cold allodynia would be more appropriate as well as tactile. And Again, as you 
correctly pointed out, there will be uh, differential modality changes. But the other thing to consider is that what is the aim of testing the compound? If it's looking to test a compound for clinical, they might want to also consider looking at other measures as well, trying to get at other aspects of neuropathies, uh, such as spontaneous pain, which is a big uh, problem. Great. Uh, thank you both for your thoughtful responses. Our, our next question in the Q&A session, how long does the pain behavior persist in the Bennett and Chung models? And can you talk more about post-procedures post um, post in behavioral studies done in Bennett and Chung pain models? Uh, so I'll leave it up to our speakers to decide who wants to jump in first and who wants to address the, this question. Well, I can take a crack at it, and tomorrow I always like her, her opinion as well. Um, so the models are quite different with uh, the CCI model constricting A-beta fibers in, in sciatic nerve, whereas more uh, DRD jam damage in, in the Chung animal ligating L5 and L6. Clearly, I would have to say that the Chung model has a more sustained neuropathic effect than the, the Bennett model. Um, there probably are exceptions in certain labs where Bennett animals um, go out past 21, 28 days and are still allodynic. I think central sensitization is maintained um, with uh, um, continually um, um, doing bond fry testing in these animals mm -hmm. and um, you, you continue to get this <clears throat> low threshold um, sensitization continuing on. In my previous lab, we did about 350 Chung animals every three to four months, and we used them. We knew our target. We washed them out. We used them for long periods of time. They got better, better, better as far as having neuropathies. In the Bennett model, I would have to say anywhere from day 10 to 14, you could measure uh, in cold allodynia, tactile allodynia, thermal hyperalgesia. And then if those animals get put back, that, that effect tends to wane after 28. It tends to resolve. Is that your experience, Tamara? Right. So one of the things that um, I'd like to do to address this question is point out that we very, very, it just came out, recently published an article looking at a prolonged time course after L5 and L6 uh, uh, spinal nerve trans, uh, ligation. And what we observed was it depended on what we were measuring. So we found that tactile allodynia persisted for um, <laughs> up to around 600 days, whereas thermal hypersensitivity diminished within, I'd say, you know, between 40 to 50 days. Um, the other thing that we did with this model was we looked at whether the ongoing or spontaneous pain persisted after the recovery of the thermal hypersensitivity, day 60 post-ligation. And what we found was, yes, indeed, the spontaneous pain persisted past this time point as well. So again, looking at the different modalities, you get kind of different answers, and it's really important to think about what your goal is when looking at these different assays and different outcome measures. I hope that was clear. Great. Thank you both, again, for really walking us through those answers and providing us with some of your insights. Our next question, are chemically induced pain models better than genetically modified animals? And this person wrote in brackets uh, that they're referring to mice and rats. So again, I'm wondering what our speakers might have to say about this. Um, I, I don't work so much with genetically modified animals for pain. Maybe Tamara can comment on that. But, but he's talking about uh, chemical induced neuropathy such as streptozosin or some of the oxaloplatin, for example, or the chemotherapy induced models. Um, I, I, I don't really know the answer to that because I'm not familiar with the genetically modified models. Okay, so um, with the um, chemically induced models, one thing to always bring into consideration is the overall health of the animal when looking at the behavioral outcomes. With the transgenic different models, that's really used to look at the effect general, uh, which I know of, of specific molecules or ligands to determine their role in pain. 
And so they may you want to you may want to look across a variety of pain assays to look at what that molecule does in those different settings. I'm not sure if I misunderstood the question, but um, they seem to be very different um, models and very different questions being asked by using the animal models. Great. Well, thank you so both both of you so much for at least uh, considering what's uh, interpreting that question for us and, and coming up with a thoughtful answer yet again. Our next question: Are there any animal models for tooth pain? So, speakers, I'm, I'm wondering what you what you two have to say about this. Well, dental pulp is a is a great um, clinical. Um, pain model, but I'm not sure they're pulling teeth out of rodents. Do you know, Tamara? I, I don't know of any. Um, I know there's certainly facial pain models, but the ones I can think of are the uh, oral cancers, which are really very nicely done, um, as well as like trigeminal um, neuropathic pain, but I don't know of any tooth models. Okay. Um, our last question, because it looks like we're, we're drawing near to the end of our uh, webinar session. What is the throughput of, C of the CPP assay? So the CPP assay does take a much longer time to do than doing bone fry assay, for example, uh, because of course you do it across three days rather than across maybe a time course of hours. Um, it also has, because it's a more complex behavior, it has higher variability and requires more test subjects to perform. And so if you're considering throughput, it might not be your initial screening tool, but it's an excellent tool to determine whether you should bring this compound forward to the clinic to look at patients with that persistent ongoing pain or spontaneous pain. Great. Um, thank you so much, both of you, uh, Tamara for that, Dr. King for that, uh, that answer, as well as Ms. Linda Headley, again, for coming up with some very solid answers for some of the, the numerous questions that have come in. So it looks like our webinar session is coming to a close. But I'd like to, of course, thank again our speakers for today for their insightful presentations and for really taking the time to answer those questions that came in from you, the audience. Again, I'd also like to thank everyone, that includes our attendees, for really participating in today's conference and making it such an engaging and interesting discussion. I'd also like to remind you that a recorded, a recorded version of this webinar will be made available, and you will be able to access it through the EurofinPanLabs.com website, as well as through xtalks.com. We hope that you found this conference informative, and have a great day. <laughs>